Good morning, everyone. Good morning for the people joining us from Brazil. Good local time for our guests from abroad. Happy to see you all. Just allow some minutes to, so all the guests can join the room. Today, we're also gonna be live, streaming live to Cine's channel on YouTube. So if you have any issues with your connection, you can watch us on YouTube, on Cine's channel. The link for the YouTube channel, you can find on the website of the event, uh, of the workshop, I will, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Marcelo already posted on the chat panel, the link for the YouTube. You are free to share this link with your colleagues and collaborators. And um, well, I would like to welcome all to the second day of our workshop. Today we follow the same format that we that we had yesterday. In the morning, we're gonna have three presentations. Today is the methane to product projects, low temperature projects. So we're gonna have three presentations today. We're starting with project 11 electrophotocatalysis, then we move to project 13, which is electrocatalysis, electrocatalysis, PEM fuel cell-like reactors, and project 14, same subject, but looking more to the main brains instead of the electrodes. And then we move to the afternoon sessions. We're gonna continue the brilliant lectures that we had yesterday from Fernando Marx, Professor Fernando Marx and Professor Jeff Miller that both gave us excellent talks yesterday and they will continue this afternoon. So I strongly advise all the students of CINE to join those sessions as well. As a general reminder for us all, it's just to keep our microphones Muted, please mute your microphone so we avoid noise, unnecessary disturbing noises in the room. During the presentations, we, we will allow questions at the end of each presentation. We have a reasonable time for questions after each presentation. So feel free to ask your questions. Like the professor said yesterday, both Fernando Marx and Jeff Miller, they insisted a lot. There are no dumb questions. There are only dumb answers, said Professor Fernando Marx. And we are more than welcome to, to, to transmit your questions. Even if you're, if you're shy to, 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 to ask the presenters in English, you, you can post on the chat panel your, your question in Portuguese, and then we will translate it. That holds for the whole sessions for today and tomorrow. So don't be shy, make your questions, interact. Use this great opportunity that you have to interact with the people and, you know, to get involved with the research and results that we're gonna present you. For those who are bold and want to make the questions, you're also really welcome. You can turn on your camera. You can raise your hand. There is a reaction button here on the, on the bottom of the panel of Zoom application. You have a reaction button. There is a raise your hand function over there. Raise your hand. And then I'm gonna, and I'm gonna ask you to open your camera, open your microphone, and you can make your questions, okay? So questions are welcome. I'm gonna host, I'm gonna chair this morning session again. And then in the afternoon, we will have the same chairs. Professor Daniel Zanetti de Florida will host 
Professor Fernando Marx, short lecture, and Professor Ander Ferlau, to both from UFABC, will host Jeff Miller's lecture. Uh, we have all the participants and, and, and speakers of this morning session already logged in in our room. We have tested all the presentations previously. I have to thank again Marcelo from Aquaviva for the excellent support in, our, in this event. I have to thank again Cine Hub, Ana Flavia, and Juarez, both that allowed us to, to the support of Aquaviva and, and supporting our event. Thank you very much. I also have to thank all the invited speakers. We have a constellation of invited speakers. On the last day, Wednesday, we have three invited speakers, three invited seminars as well. And I thank you all for your participation. That, that's really nice. We, we, we are building up an event with high standards. I was thinking yesterday how to keep up with such brilliant professors and brilliant speakers. I also would like to thank our postdocs and most of our presenters, our co-PIs, our organizing committee, Miguel Negro for all the support during this organization as well. We thank you. I thank you very, very much, everybody for the support and the results. Yesterday we saw very nice presentations from Dr. Sabrina Carvalho. Myself doesn't count, but uh, I was covering the postdoc, Dr. Vivian Thyssen, and also, and also the presentation from Dr. Fabiani Trindade from UFABC. We have six more minutes to start the session. I'll, I'll ask Eliane, Dr. Eliane Ribeiro from Project 11. Maybe you can already load your presentation. Good morning, Fabio. Good morning, Eliane. How are you doing? Fine, and you? <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I start the presentation? Yeah, we can load your presentation. We have four or five more minutes. Okay. But you can get, get started. It's okay for you. Now we have to switch to the presentation mode. Now. There you go. Okay. Looks good. Okay. Okay, we are ready to go. We still have a couple of minutes. As a, I just would like to 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 encourage you to share this YouTube link to to and to invite your colleagues or students for all the sessions of today and tomorrow of our workshop. So during the cough breaks and the breaks, unfortunately the cough break, it's gonna be, uh, this time is not supported by, by the organizers, but uh, we, we strongly advise you to to stand up a little bit, to walk around, to focus your eyes somewhere else instead of the screen. It's also important to, to yourself to not remain seated and look, looking at the computer for such a long time. So that's why we have the break. So you can breathe, you can, can brew your coffee, you can walk a little bit during our breaks take that time for resting a little bit.
Perfect. So finally, I, I, I like to thank our supporters, Sharon Fabespi for supporting CINI. Also a big thank for our institutions, IPEN and UFABC, who are the, the leading institutions of the Methane to Products Division. We are very thankful for all the support. Without you, nothing of that would be possible. And Eliani, according to my official time here, we have one minute to start. Okay, Eliani, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Eliane. I'm a postdoc at Project 11, whose theme is development of photocatalysts for the conversion of methane to products of high add value coupled to the evolution of hydrogen from water. I divided this presentation into topics as following. I will start to introduce the project description and their objectives of this work. Uh, I will talk about the two different methods to obtain the photocatalysts and their main characterizations. I will to present our photocatalytic apparatus as well the methodology developing to avail the system. Uh, I will discuss about the photocatalytic results obtained until now. In the end, I will talk about the next steps of this work. This project is focused on noble metals nanoparticles supported on semiconductor materials for methane conversion to products coping with hydrogen evolution from water. For this, the first step was produce the photocatalyst, uh, photocatalysts based on semiconductors, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, and gallium oxide, decorated with nanoparticles, platinum, palladium, gold, and silver. Uh, the materials were synthesized using two different methods to reduce metal nanoparticles in order to compare the effects of morpholo morphologies and size nanoparticles. Uh, in the first method, we used the sodium borohydrate as a reducting ag agent at room temperature. In the second method, we used a mixture of water, ethylene glycol under mild temperature. The advantages uh, of this method is the, the simple method to obtain the nanoparticles. And we don't use uh, surfactants, uh, promoting uh, nanoparticles uh, free of, uh, uh, of uh, contaminations on the reactions. Um, for these methodologies, uh, these methodologies are known uh, now by our research group as references. Uh, and these materials obtained were characterized by, two, uh, by different methods in order to confirm the creation of the active nano, uh, nanocatalysts. Their first characterization technique was X-ray diffraction in order to analyze the structure obtained. 
the diffragram, uh, diffractogram patterns showed that only the well-defined peaks of the anatase and rutile crystalline phase of titanium support. No peaks of metallic nanoparticles could be observed due to the low concentration of metal and to the average size of nanoparticles, as shown in the figures. Uh, in order to determine the size and morphology, morphology of the nanoparticles, 10 images were conducted. Uh, the gold and the gold sample was analyzed and it could be seen in micrographs, the presence of the black dots correspond to gold nanoparticles, well dispersed on titanium dioxide, showing size in a range of three and six nanometers. The same profile was observed for platinum titanium dioxide photocatalysis. And these nanoparticles showing sizes in a range of two and four nanometers. Um, platinum, uh, the platinum titanium dioxide samples obtained by two different methods was compared. And we can show, we can see black dots, uh, black dots dispersed on titanium dioxide support, present size in a range of 2.5 and 5 nanometers for, for palladium. The photocatalysts were also characterized by diffuse, diffuse reflectance spectroscopy technique in order to elucidate questions about the surface and the bulk of the photocatalysts. In the first spectrum, we show a band around 500, 550 nanometers associated with the presence of the gold nanoparticles. Besides a shift around 350 nanometers related to a red shift in a band gap transition. Uh, the enhancement of light, uh, the enhancement of light absorption in the visible light region can therefore increase the quantities quantities of photoregenerated electrons and rolls that participated in photocatalytic reactions. Uh, we can see uh, the nanoparticles uh, obtained by the different methods. And for example, in the, in the silver nanoparticles, we can see a higher absorption in this region when we synthesize the nanoparticles using borohydrate. The same profile was observed for the, for the platinum nanoparticles. Uh, it, it could be, uh, associated to uh, to the math, and we can we can we can we desire uh, this it's desired, and uh, I would like uh, and these materials was applied uh, in the photocatalyst and the products. Uh, The samples were characterized by energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy in order to determine the content of metal present in the photocatalysts. Uh, unfortunately, the EDS anal analysis was performed in a semi-quantitative method and the values obtained by EDS differ, differ from the nominal values probably due to the low concentration of the metals in the samples. Uh, however, it could be seen observed the amounts of the, the metals increase with the increase of their nominal values. Uh, this analysis we repeated on WDX equipment recently acquired by the group. Until now, we can see the, met, the 
photocatalysts based on titanium dioxide. And this method is advantage. Uh, the, the principal advantage is this. Uh, we can synthesize nanoparticles with a good size and a good dispersion in the, the support. And this, mate the, the, this material have an improvement of the light absorption in UVBs. Uh, we characterize to the, the gallium oxide, uh, the materials obtained uh, with, with the gallium oxide support. And here we, we can see the diffractograms of these materials. We can see the same, the same profile or not, or not observed the nanoparticles due to the low concentration. Uh, in this picture, we can see the photocatalytic reactor. And the system, uh, the system consists in a photoreactor connected online to the gas chromatography containing three different detectors in order to detect the products in gas and liquid phase in the real time. As shown, this, the, this, chromatog this chromatography has three different detectors beside the quadrupole mass and is equipped with two different columns in order to separate, uh, to separate the C, uh, CO, C1 and C4 hydrocarbons, CO2, methane, alcohol, and oxygenate. And the gas produced, uh, produces by the photocatalytic reaction. Here we can see the, photo, the photocatalytic reactor more detailed. Uh, this reactor has a mechanical steerer uh, in order to keep the photocatalytic in suspension. Uh, the system contains a UV lamp with 450 watts and the spectra in UVA and UVA, B, and C in order to promote a more efficient photocatalysis. And this reactor is connected online to a methane gas line for flow reactions. We have a, a cooling due to the heat caused by the lamp in an exhaust system by ozone produced during the reaction. Before conducting the experiments using metal nanoparticles decorated with the same conductors, we uh, performed a series of experiments to obtain more information about the possible photochemical effects that may occur on the reaction medium in the presence of the photocatalysts. Thus, initially, we performed the three different experiments. We used just a reactor irradiated with UV lamp in the presence of methane. In the second, we used the reactor UV methane in presence of water. And we analyzed the effect, the mass of pure titanium dioxide and the methane concentration during the photocatalytic experiments. At the beginning of the first experiment, we observed a small concentration of CO2 related to residual gas into the reactor. And this, and this result is associated with a methane photooxidation. After they start the after they start the UV radiation, it was possible observe the increase of the CO2 concentration, now associated a photoxidation 
And its important uh, observation was that CO2 concentration decreases after the end of the irradiation, indicating that this reaction is photodependent. Uh, in the next experiment, now adding water into the reactor, we can see a small quanti uh, quantify of CO2, ethane, and propane. Uh, different groups have applied the, the, the Euterion label experiments to indicate that molecular elimination of hydrogen is a dominant process. And this phenomenon elucidates why hydrogen no was observed in the reactor product. The other products like ethane and propane can be, can be observed following the mechanism by CH fragments into C8 bonds. Here we can see a table comparing the, the areas of CO2 obtained in the experiments using only UV lamp in the presence, in the presence of methane and the, compared with the experiment using UV lamp in the presence of methane and water. We can observe the increase of CO2 and the produce of the ethane and propane molecules. Here we can see uh, an increase. Uh, it's important to note that, that the, the that the increase of the product, CO2, ethane, and propane during the radiation, besides the decreased concentration of methane during the, the reaction. These results indicate that products were obtained by CO2, uh, methane consuming, as shown in the figure. Finally, 250 nanograms of titanium dioxide was introduced in the reactor. And the reaction was monitored after one hour of liquid solid equilibrium. And before they start the radiation, no product was observed. After the radiation, the products CO2, ethane, and propane and carbon monoxide was observed. After turn off the UV lamp, the reaction was monitored and no products was identified. It's important to uh, see uh, the, the hydrogen uh, no was observed. In order to determine the best conditions for photocatalytic experiments, we analyzed the small mass of titanium dioxide, and the results shows a high concentration, high concentration of ethane, propane, CO, and a decrease of the CO2 production. Uh, Here we can see the chromatogram related to this material using, uh, using a, small, a small mass of titanium dioxide. And we compare it with a chromatogram containing hydrogen. And we can see no uh, and no product uh, no production of hydrogen in this process uh, we did experiments with pure methane and methane in uh, five uh, 50% in helium and we can see that the decrease of the formation of the product was proportional to the decrease of the concentration of methane. 
uh, when evaluating the CO2 produced, it was possible to observe the increase in the CO2 concentration, which, in, uh, which is not desirable. Thus, we, we were able to obtain ideal parameters for, for conducting the photocatalytic tests, which unfortunately have been paralyzed since the beginning of the last year. We also did uh, calibration covers for methane and hydrogen, where you can see a good response. And here we present the next steps of the work. Uh, we need to start the application of the Nobel medals supported on titanium dioxide. Uh, we need to do the calibration curve for all the products and finish the synthesis, the synthesis and characterization of Nobel, Nobel medals supported on the zinc oxide and gallium oxide. This is our team. And I would like to thank uh, to, uh, the funding ag agencies, CINE, IPEN, Federal University of ABC for their collaborations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Eliane, for a presentation. Thank you for keeping up the time. Um, the session is open for questions. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. You can raise your hand using the reaction button here on the, on the bottom of the Zoom app. We have also people monitoring our YouTube live channel for questions over there. You can use the chat panel at YouTube for shooting questions. Don't be shy. You can even use the chat panel. You can write your questions in Portuguese and we're gonna translate it to the speaker. I have a question from Fabiani Trindade. Fabiani, you can, can turn the camera on. Okay. Uh, good morning, Eliane. Thank you for your excellent presentation. So congratulations for your great results. So actually, I have two questions. So the first one is, I saw your diffuse reflectance uh, spectrum. So have you estimated the band gap values for your catalysts? Hi, Fabiani. Um, until now, we don't don't uh, measurement the, the band gap because these samples uh, uh, need to, uh, the samples is, uh, we need to, to compare the, the samples and we need to, to calculate the band gap to compare the, the different methods, uh, different methods and their band gap. But we did, uh, did not, we not did this, this calculated. Okay. So another question is about the time of irradiation. How long did you irradiate your catalysts in the, in the system? Uh, the system, we work with, in a flow reaction and okay. the, the time is about one hour, two hours of radiation. In so you irradiate and then after one hour, you analyze the products. Is that right? Yeah, we, st uh, we start the lamp and uh, start the reaction. Okay. And, uh, and the, the, the analyzed in, in real time and uh, compared the, the, the last results with uh, radiation and the, the uh, before the radiation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Eliane. Thank you. 
Any other questions coming from the audience? Juarez, uh, Juarez. Leon, okay, thanks, Fab. Leon, first, congratulations for the nice talk. Okay, you are trying to support those transition metal particles on the oxide surface. That's right. Means, uh, how is the lag of the size of those particles, like in the case of that you are using at the moment, on gallium oxide? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in a titanium dioxide, we use the P. 20, 25 particles, uh, the commercial titania. Uh, for zinc oxide, we use the, the size uh, uh, five, uh, 50 nanometers and uh, 100 uh, nanometers. And gallium oxide, I use the commercial Aldrich material. And these particles have a, uh, have a three, four, three, five uh, micrometers. And now I synthesized, I tried to synthesize the, the support to compare it with the commercial support. Can I have a second question, Fabio? Just one second question. That's all on that. Uh, for example, normally zinc oxide or titanium oxide, those oxides, they have a higher, higher concentration of oxygen vacancies. Means once you receive those samples, do you do some type of treatment? to try to decrease or to enhance those vacancies. What's the role of those vacancies when you do the support for the photocatalyst? Because you are doing the what put the particles over this uh, low system. Um, we don't analyze this, these parameters yet, but uh, it's well, well discussed in the literature. This, uh, this support this is uh, good for uh, uh, for the, the photocatalyst, but we need to, to analyze better these materials in, and compare it to the, the photocatalytic, uh, photocatalytic is, uh, products with this, these properties. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And thank you, Juarez. Well, we have a question coming from the chat panel from Ana Carolina. Good morning. She would like to ask why to present the area of the products, the, the area. I mean, she's probably refer, she probably refers to the data analysis of your plots. So why, why to present the area of the products instead of presenting the concentration of the products measured in micromoles per gram, like usually people do in gas chromatography? Um, as, as shown in the presentation, I don't, I don't develop the, the, the curve, the calibration curves for all the other products. And because this, I compared it just the areas. But when, I, uh, when we develop the curves, I will put this value into the curves and uh, uh, define the concentration of the products. Okay, it's a matter of calibration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have a short one. Do you have a benchmark to like where where do you think your concentrations of your products, the literature reports, what what you have as a target to to reach? What when we're going to be happy with your results in terms of reaching a, a nice conversion rate? Um, it's a problem because the photocatalysis uh, in the all the area produces a small concentration uh, in order to uh, nanomole, nanomole, micromole for liter. And uh, it, it's a problem. Uh, in, the, in this phase, we need to produce, we would like to produce a small concentration of the products. Uh, 
based on C2, C1, C2, uh, besides the hydrogen evolution. But the, in this area is a problem, the concentrated, uh, high concentration is a problem. No, we know that high concentrations, it's not <laughs> like the, the goal, but um, even though you, you have some targets, some numbers that could guide yourself, guide your research. So that would be an interesting number to, to have in order to, to, keep, to keep your goals. We're not uh, expecting liters per minute or yeah. so with this. If you look the the publications, the the most of the, the publications talk about the se selectivity, uh, convert methane into C2, but uh, the concentrations is a, is a problem. Always the, the most of the cases is a, millimoles, nanomole. Okay, great. So then talking about selectivity, what, what is the target for the selectivity then? Uh, we need to, to select the uh, parameters. And uh, now, you, uh, now we analyze the, the different nanoparticles and compare, and compare the, the, the values and the products with the, the selectivity now, we, uh, with the literature too. But okay. now if we, can, we can compare because we don't test the, these materials yet. Okay. Okay, Eliane, thank you very much for the presentation. We give thank you a virtual round of applause and thank you very much. And we move our session to the next. Speaker. Now we have project 13 presented by, by Dr. Andresa. Andres is online with us. Olá, estão me ouvindo? Yes. Hi. <laughs> I forgot. So, everybody see my presentation, my Yes, thank you very slides. much. The floor is yours. So, hi, good morning, everybody. I am Andres Ramos. I'm a postdoctoral uh, fellow at Dr. Almir Neto. And today I would like to present the main results of project entitled Develop of Catalysts for Selective Formation of Methanol from Methane Fuel Cell Systems. And this is our team. Oops. This is our team and um, the result uh, that I will present were obtained in, in this almost 30, 30 months. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, which work plan was presented to ANP and NERC. Uh, and one of focus of the project coordinated by Dr. Almir is the investigation and application of fuel cell reactors 
uh, to generate energy and chemicals, especially methanol, by oxidation of methane on other particles, metal based catalysts. And uh, we managed to carry out the plane activities and thus stay within the S curve that measure our progress. Uh, the next step is to synthesize and, um, and test the second generation uh, catalysts that are being synthesized by the group uh, Dr. Thiago Lopes. And the group are working tailoring active science in carbon nanostructures, mimicking biocatalytic enzyme systems here in gas phase, and we will soon be testing these materials. But in our, in one of our first results, we use the methane to generate electricity in fuel cells. And we noticed that the hydrogen sorption regime increased a lot when methane is added to electrochemical solutions, solution. Mm, but methane is generally not oxidized below over potentials. So we would not see energy generation at low over potential. However, uh, with in situ infrared spectroscopy uh, techniques, we observe products of methane oxidation as methanol and formic acid. But in alcohol, proton exchange in brain fuel cell, the electrochemical process depends on the activation of water as it increases the completeness oxidation of fuel and increases energy efficiency. And the break of one of the water bonds can generate hydroxyl radicals that perform radical substitution does the addition of functional group to a hydrocarbon, which is a stable molecule, uh, occur? Um, to test this theory, there is the participation of reactive oxygen species uh, in methanol generation. We set up a proton exchange membrane fuel cell system contain hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide and methane at the cathode. And if methane reactivity were associated with the formation of these radicals, we would observe product formation. And these products could be evidenced by current drop in the cell. The first indication was obtained from the results of the curve made only with hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide. Then we made a comparison with another curve made with hydrogen peroxide and methane. In this graph, we can apparently observe three um, diffusion falls, but um, they can occur due to the formation of products. And each time an organic product is formed, the reactor current decreases or falls. This is because there is a competition for sites on the cathode where occur the reduction of peroxide to water and oxidation of methane to products. Therefore, um, the formed products will be absor absorbed on sites that normally should be used by the peroxide. Then uh, we analyze by infrared spectroscopy the effluent of cells generated in, in niche potential. And we detected the presence of formaldehyde, formic acid, and methanol. And found that at each potential, operation, a different amount of methanol was being formed. So in the first work, we tested the fuel cell concept. There are no large values of current or power density, but the observed current is associated with the formation of products. In the second 
published the work, we started testing the reactor concept and we verified that process was not purely paradigm. So um, we know that cells in an acidic environment work with water vapor, which will be activated to form chemical species. This is a necessary process in the alcohol cell because this species um, brown activated the water also removes the catalytic poison. And on the other hand, when you use the cells in alkaline medium with an uh, aqueous solution rich in hydroxyl ions, the breaking of the water will further facilitate the formation of radicals respecting the Le Chatelier principle. And this causes the cell to present both, both great power for cogeneration of energy and greater efficient for converging methane and methanol. And to check this theory, um, to check which method would be most efficient for methanol generation, doctor student Monique Santos tested the three of most commonly used metals for oxidation in fuel cell anode, platinum, palladium, and nickel. And we verify that platinum generates more power. However, uh, an average Palladium was more efficient. And uh, the generate products were identified. And palladium worked in many potentials for methanol generation. Um, since palladium being a very interesting base metal due to the affinity of its palladium oxides for methane and the, its ability to activate water. And nickel is a good water activator as well to all potentials. However, it does not uh, absorb methane well. Therefore, we have an average production of only 10% for nickel, while for other metal, this percentage was higher mainly at the maximum power value of the curve. And this is an article that had a great visibility and downloads. And in this work developed, um, sorry, uh, in this next work uh, is the result of an international collaboration with, with the researcher Dr. Ahmed, known for his work with fuel cell uh, for power generation. And we use binary catalysts that showed better results in previous work, palladium and nickel. Nickel due to its efficiency in activating water and palladium for facilitating the activation of methane. And we observed that the addition of nickel to the palladium catalyst increased the possible energy density to be obtained in this cell. And we also found that the pure palladium can produce more methanol only in one potential compared to the other compositions. However, binary materials, in addition to giving us the advantage of gaining more conversion efficiency throughout the curve, it still allows us to save on palladium. It's interesting to report that in matter of innovation, uh, an adaptation of the Raman equipment was made to carry out cells tests in situ. A cell was adapted to Raman probe for this to be done. And in search of method that activate water efficiently, we found the copper. Camila Godoy uh, developed this work. And here we found new evidence of what we observed earlier. But we need more evidence that water activation is associated with methanol production. 
And we use the results obtained by rotating ring disc. Sorry, rotatory uh, RRDE uh, to estimate which would be the most active materials. And we verify that there is an optimal composition for the activation of water necessary to obtain best yield in the total production of methanol. We see that this range is between five and six percent. And in this way, we were able to associate that obtained from RRDE with that obtained from tests with the reactor for qualitative determination of the products being formed. A differential mass detector was adapted to the effluent outlet on the reactor, the reactor. And once the dams tools was adapted to, we decided to explore uh, which reaction paths would be taking place in the process of partial methane station. This, the dam tool coupled to the reactor started to, to be used for qualitative analysis of a broader series of molecules that will be being formed in the uh, fuel cell. This, it was possible to map, according to the potentials, the formation of different products. And due to the ex existence of products of partial oxidation of methane, different from those observed in total oxidation, we found that there is a possible reaction pathway by radical road. There is. After the methane and water are activated, the form the radicals propagate and the radical reaction sequence, sequence occurs. Um, we started the testing modified catalysts named COF or MOF. This catalyst consists in uh, an organometallic mixture that allows saving in the use of noble metal, metals. And as we are not yet producing these catalysts, we do tests with materials from our partnerships. <clears throat> this article is the result of a partnership with the uh, University du Quebec from Canada. And Dr. Student Luis Silva, a senior scholarship student, was selected for an inter internship in the new leaders in chemistry project with the group of Dr. Adam with Canadian scholarship. And the test is cough synthesized from, from copper as a metal, proved to be efficient in converting methane in methanol. And the most active material for methanol production have about five or six selected for hydrogen peroxide in nine indirect water activation tests using RRDE as previously presented. And during this almost 30 months of project, other synthesis routes were tested to improve the performance of catalysts. And one of these alternatives was to synthesize the material under the influence of electromagnetic field and radio frequency pulses to change some characteristics of this material. This material started to show different adsorption, become more resistant to catalytic poisons such as CO. And the layers parameters of its, its crystals are also changed. Even metals known to not respond magnetically like platinum uh, were modified. And this work uh, was carried out in partnership with Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Laboratory at Federal University of Amazonas. And the new generation of catalysts will bring challenge on how to deal with their interface 
And one of those interface well known in proton exchange membrane fuel cell that can be improved is the so-called gas diffusion layer or DDL. Therefore, uh, DDL was developed with the same amount of PTF polymer <clears throat> present in a, in, in a normal DDL. However, the polymer is applied by electrospinning. In this way, it's possible to create islon of PTF in, a, in the layer that will, be, will remove excess worm maintain the amount necessary for the reaction to occur. In the case of reaction involving hydrogen and oxygen in a standard cell, we verify that with the use of this electrospinning DDL, the, there is a delay in the moment of diffusion of fall, observing the polarization curves. This indicates that there is a better diffusion of gas. Um, some, some tools have been adapted to better understand the process, such as electrochemical cell with three electrodes and two electrodes for Ramon, online differential mass spectrometer with polymeric electrolyte reactor fuel cell type, a reactor made of steel to replace gra uh, graphite, uh, plates that suffer great wear during conversion reactions or uh, have been replaced. And Dr. Lopes and his team are working in the synthesis of second generation electrocatalysts. The, the, the ob objective of this research front is to develop catalysts that promote selective oxidation of methane to methanol through the oxygen reduction reactions and by the adaption of active sites in carbon nanostructures, mimicking biocatalytic enzymatic systems. The research also seeks to understand the direct influence of precursor on the performance and stability of these electrocatalysts. In the sense, the computational tool as a sport in the search being used. Uh, in the synthesis of this material, a pyrolysis process occurs. The pyrolysis stage promotes a series of chemical transformation resulting in carbon material with a large surface area and activated sites. So um, this is our main results in the moment. Um, there are some considerations about the results obtained and it was possible to demonstrate on a laboratory scale which are the best system for methanol production with the best electrocatalysts. Our RD experiments have helped to identify the best materials that operate in optimal range. Um, reactive species of uh, or radicals are the basis for converting methane into products with energy cogeneration. And this process is not only paradigm. This species uh, reactive causes severe wear in carbon-based materials. So we have we have started proposing to uh, improve the second generation that deals better deals better with this species. And we have advanced in our results despite limited access to laboratories due to the pandemic. And our future perspectives is to have mastery over reactive oxygen species in radicals and the stud and adaptation for the complete replacement of 
carbon in the materials that make up the reactor in pro is in progress. It's necessary to adapt materials that are more resistant to this piece to increase selectivity and decrease wear of the reactors since the carbon has great affinity with this piece. Therefore, it's important to re replace these materials. And our uh, knowledge for the, um, the founder agents and to the scene. Thank you very much. Okay, Andresa, thank you very much for a nice presentation. The session is open, it's open for questions. Hello? You can use it bad now, you can, Elizabeth. Yes, um, Andresa, congratulations for a very nice presentation. I have two questions, actually are very quick questions. Uh, I would like to know what the methodology employed for catalyst synthesis. And the, I would like to know if the properties, such as particle size, homogeneity, et cetera, have an influence on the methane oxidation um, properties. Hello? Have you heard me? Oh, hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, are you asking me about the Amazonas work? Catalyst? No, actually, I need, by uh, actually in Palladian based the catalyst. I mean, I would like it to uh, all, all, me all methods we all methods. All methods um, to synthesis is based on borohydrate um, uh, reduction. Okay. Um, and the, the methodology or properties such as um, particle size, homogeneity, have influence on the methane oxidation by using this kind of uh, catalysts. That's my point. Uh, the, the, the particle present, the um, parameter of particle about um, five nanometers as um, size of particle. Um, the characterization of this material revealed that uh, they present uh, some oxidized uh, ox of palladium. These ox uh, facilitates the interaction with methane and the activation of water. Um, so this, this method is, is a classic method used in electrochemistry. Okay, thank you so much. No more question. Thank you, Elizabeth. Another question from Fabiani. Hi, Andresa. Thank you for your great presentation. So I'm quite curious about your Raman your human in situ measurements, especially in the apparatus. How is to deal with the work distance in the of the lens and the apparatus? Um, approximately 10 millimeters. And the other okay. question, sorry. Uh, okay, no, I'm just quite curious about the system. I would like to know a little bit more. I don't know if you can tell me. I know you don't do everything. Maybe another student did this apparatus. So I'm just quite curious because we, we are planning to do some in situ measurements using the Roman equipment. So I just would like to know a little bit more. <laughs> Fabiani, uh, you, you can consult or read the, the article that we present here, but we, okay. you, you can come visit us to, to know the, the, the experiment. 
and, and try tests with your material someday. Okay, you just measure powder or like uh, what, what kind of samples that, that you can measure in this, in this apparatus? What kind of samples? And any kind of, of samples. Oh, great, great. Okay, I, I can send you an email and then we, we can talk better about this. So thank you. Okay, okay. We have time for a final last quick question. I see no questions coming from the audience. Here, you can also, if you're watching us live on YouTube, Cine's channel, you can use the chat panel on YouTube for questions, okay? And uh, well, if no more questions, we we are well. We move to the next presenter then, and we thank again, Dr. Andresa Ramos and Professor Almir's group for for the presentation. Thank you very much. A virtual round of applause for for all the group and the results. Thank you very much. And we move now to the final presentation of this morning. Yeah, Ana Laura, Dr. Ana Laura Paul is here with us. Thank you very much. Can load your presentation and allow the please. Okay. Okay, can you see? Is all good? Fabio, is all good? Well, in my screen here, I see a little bit of a shade on the upper part of your slide. Shade? Can you move? Yeah, right there. Yes, yeah, it's like a rectangular mask. It's from the Zoom I thing. I, I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> and Laura, you can move this part of the Zoom to down. Ah, okay. I just don't know where to put it because <laughs> there is no place. Is it fine if I leave it here? I mean, maybe it's better if you move it down, right? Down, okay. But then it's going to be on my results, I think. Here's okay. Because there's no place for this thing. Like, it doesn't disappear. Okay, you can try to move on like that if you plan your presentation for... Okay, so I'm okay. Going. Okay, Anna Laura, we, we try like that. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So, good morning. My name is Ana Laura. I'm a postdoc uh, fellow of Professor Elizabeth Santiago. I'm a part of Division 3, Project 14, uh, electrochemical conversion of methane to methanol mediated by carbon dioxide. And today I'm going to present a little bit of uh, part of our ongoing works. Uh, the title of my presentation is Synthesis of Highly Conductive and Stable Anion Exchange Membranes uh, for Electrochemical Conversion of Methane. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start briefly uh, explaining the difference between anion exchange membrane fuel cells and proton exchange membrane fuel cells, uh, the famous PEN fuel cells. Pen fuel cells, they conduct protons from the anode to the cathode, and the reactions that involve energy production are shown in here. Uh, this type of fuel cell has been developed and studied since the 90s. Uh, however, there's still an expensive energy source, mainly due to the cost of its components, such as electrodes and electrolytes, for example. As an alternative, anion exchange membranes started gaining space. In this type of fuel cell, uh, anions are conducted from the cathode to the anode, as you can see here in the figure. And the solid electrolyte for this type of fuel cell started being studied around the uh, 2000s. So the technology is very recent. Um, the development of solid electrolytes provides the expansion of the application of this type of material, 
uh, to other electrochemical devices, such as supercapacitors uh, or electrochemical reactors in general. And this is where um, we make the link between annual exchange membranes and the methane conversion. At low temperatures, methane will not release a proton under attack uh, by the hydroxide ion, but the carbonate ion, for example, oxidizes uh, species by donating uh, oxygen and releasing CO2. Uh, due to the high enthalpy of the reaction for the formation of CO2 and favorable kinetics, the carbonate ion could be used for oxidation of methane and would be uh, used instead of the hydroxide ion in this uh, reaction. So as I show here uh, on the slide, methane would react with the carbonate ion to form uh, methanol and CO2 and release four electrons. And then this CO2 uh, reacts with oxygen and the cathode and form more electrons and form carbonate ion that will be used at the anode. Uh, here, as you can see, there are many products that can be generated from the reaction that I showed in the previous slides. So we will not have only methanol. Uh, there's the possibility of uh, the possible formation of countless other products, such as methanoic acid, formaldehyde, CO, among other molecules. This is where the importance of catalyst and selectivity of the reaction comes in, but it's not the focus of our work here. So to synthesize the annual exchange membranes, we use the method of pre-irradiation uh, for grafting. Uh, this is one of the methods. I'm going to talk about other one later. In this method, the films that the prefab films, in this case, I'm going to talk about ETFE. Uh, is are irradiated by an electron beam at the desired dose and then grafted in the lab with vinyl benzyl chloride, which is this molecule here, the VBC. Um, during irradiation, radicals are formed and we stop the film at minus 40 degrees to preserve them. Then in the grafting step, uh, the radicals react with the VBC by thermal decomposition. Uh, after the grafting reaction, we functionalize uh, our film with a quaternary ammonium, ammonium, amine, sorry, <laughs> amine, uh, which is the molecule that will carry the anions across the membrane. Uh, there are several amines that we can uh, use. In our case, we've been working with trimethylamine, uh, methylpyrrolidine, and methylpyperidine. So, um, oops, sorry. So as you can see in the message, in the image here, uh, we have the grafted membrane, it's uh, white. And then this is the uh, membrane ready to be used. So it's like yellowish and translucent. So there are two properties that are fundamental in solid electrolytes in electrochemical reactors. It's the ionic conductivity and the chemical stability. Many works in the literature have talked about the attack of the hydroxide ion on the amine or on the monomer grafted into the base polymer. Uh, that depends a lot on the hydration level of the membrane. Uh, but few works have focused on the stability of this base polymer. If the base polymer undergoes uh, any type of degradation, the entire membrane will degrade or, became, or become fragile. So this is uh, the structure of the ETFE that, uh, that's uh, the polymer we've been working with. Um, so speaking of the possibility, poss possible degradations um, of the base polymer, when ETFE or any other polymer is exposed to an electron B radiation, which is our first step of the synthesis, the initial reaction involves breaking the bonds of uh, carbon and fluorine and carbon-carbon, leading uh, to the formation of macro radicals, as we show here. You can see the macro radicals. Um, these macro radicals undergo competitive reactions with each other. One of them is the formation of cross-linking structure formed from the reaction between the two radicals, which is this structure here. Uh, and this cross-linking uh, reinforces the structure of the film, but in excess can make the film very fragile, very rigid. 
Another reaction is the formation of unsaturated structures that result in scission of the polymer chain, which characterizes degradation, which is the second case here. In presence of oxygen, peroxidation takes place, leading to hydroperoxides after hydrogen abstraction from ethylene molecules, which also can accelerate the degradation process uh, of the base polymer. Um, these reactions, they depend on the irradiation conditions. For example, uh, if I have the, the atmosphere of the irradiation, uh, if I have uh, radiation uh, being done in an inert atmosphere like uh, nitrogen, the stability of the radicals uh, will be increased. And the reactions that I showed in the previous slides will happen in less intensity. Not to mention that there will be no formation of hydroperoxides. And then there will be more mole, um, radicals available for the grafting later, right? Uh, the temperature is another important factor. It can favor both cross-linking or chain scission reactions. That depends how high is the temperature. And the dose rate follows the same trend as the temperature. So um, in this contest as I presented so far, our objective in this work is to understand and compare the effects of irradiation conditions uh, on our final product, which is the new exchange membrane, aiming uh, at highly conductive and stable materials. Uh, so these uh, results that I'm going to show now, uh, they have been submitted to the Journal of Membrane Science, and it, we did it in a partnership with a, a, a research in Israel. Um, so uh, we characterize, characterize these membranes in many ways. One of them is using Raman, but I'm not going to show here. Uh, and one of this characterization uh, is with respect to the degree of grafting and uh, ion exchange capacity. We call it IC, which will be directly linked to the conductivity of the sample and the water absorption, which is the water uptake. Um, high degrees of grafting represents that high amount of VBC, our monomer, uh, were added in the backbone of the polymer. Consequently, the high, we have high ICs after amination, as there are more seeds available for the amine to react. Uh, usually in the literature samples, they are irradiated in a room temperature, at room temperature, and in air in presence of oxygen. Uh, here, we decided to irradiate uh, in nitrogen atmosphere at room temperature and also in air, but at low temperature. We made like a layer of uh, uh, dry ice and we irradiated the samples on this layer, on top of this layer. So the names here, just to, to, so you can follow, uh, we'll always show the dose. So the X here is the dose. Uh, and then the atmosphere, air or nitrogen, and then the temperature, so room temperature or low temperature. So here are the results of uh, these membranes, but I'm gonna better explain in this next slide here in the chart. Um, so here we can see the result, results in a more illustrative way. And in the case of samples irradiated at 40 kilograms, this dose, we managed to increase the degree of grafting uh, from 55% to 80% when we compare samples irradiated in air and samples irradiated uh, in nitrogen and also in air but low temperature. So here we have the result of air in room temperature and then the other two types. We increased the degree of grafting and also the IC of the samples. Uh, the sample irradiated in nitrogen in 20 kilograms that means half of the dose of this 40 kilograms has practically the same uh, degree of grafting and ion exchange capacity of the sample irradiated uh, in air and room temperature, but with 40 kilograms. So just by switching the, the atmosphere, we get same result with half of the dose. Another interesting thing is that all the synthesis uh, normally take uh, 16 hours. But if we irradiate in nitrogen atmosphere, we can achieve the same degree of grafting in just one hour. 
That's the case uh, um, of this figure here. So we see 52% in just one hour. And when we had uh, air and room temperature, we reached the same degree of grafting, but in 16 hours. Uh, when, uh, in the case of the samples irradiated at 100 kilograms, it's a very high dose, the difference observed were even greater. So uh, the film irradiated in air and room temperature uh, showed 85% of degree of grafting, which is this one here. And the film irradiated in low temperature increased to 143% and reaching almost three uh, as ion exchange capacity. Um, and the one irradiated under nitrogen atmosphere uh, reached 109%. So they have all higher ICs. Um, in order to evaluate modifications on mechanical properties after irradiation, we perform tensile stress tests. Considering the process steps um, that uh, ETF films go through, like irradiation, grafting, and func functionalization, it's reasonable to predict that they may affect the mechanical properties of the resulting membranes. So what you can extract from this figure in brief is that if you use high doses like 100 kilograms, normally you have high uh, degree of grafting, but you have more fragile membranes. For example, the sample irradiated in air and low temperature, which is uh, this one here, had a very, the, the highest IC, but the elongation at break fell dramatically with the degree of grafting in this set of AEMs. See? If you compare with the others, the um, elongation at break is very low, showing then that two grafted membranes can become rigid and therefore too fragile to break. So it's not interesting for the application. We have a, like high IC, but then it's too fragile. Um, so if we look at the samples irradiated uh, 40 kilograms, uh, we have the sample irradiated in nitrogen um, as the best one. It has the highest elastic modulus and reasonable elongation to break. This is an indication that the cross-linking prevails over the chain scission uh, reactions for samples in atmosphere of nitrogen, resulting in stiffening of the samples, but not making them fragile. So after checking mechanical properties, we chose the best samples for electrochemical measurements. And here there are some measurements of the true hydroxide conductivity of these membranes. And these measures, measurements were made by a partner from Israel, as I said in the beginning. And basically we start measuring the membrane in the carbonate form. Uh, and through the application of a current, we obtain the hydro, hydroxide form after several hours. It's interesting here to highlight um, the difference between the conductivities of the carbonate form and the hydroxide form. So we see here the carbonate is around 20, 30 millisiems per centimeter. And then we come to the hydroxide form. And we can see that all samples irradiated in 40 kilograms have a maximum conductivity around 140 millisiems per centimeter, uh, which is one of the highest in the literature so far. And the one irradiated in 100 kilograms, which is this black one here, has shown a maximum conductivity of 110. Um, so uh, when we do, we observe the stability test done between 70 and 90 hours, we notice that there is a great loss of conductivity compared samples irradiated with 40 and 100 kilograms in the same conditions. So these two were irradiated under air and room temperature. But if you see the stability test, they are completely different. Um, for samples irradiated with same dose, but different conditions, which is the second graph here, it's possible to notice best stability for the one irradiated under nitrogen atmosphere, which is this one in, in red here. Uh, which was a sample with the best, best mechanical properties too, right? So uh, this membrane irradiated under nitrogen um, has proven to be the most promising AEM. All membranes irradiated with 40 kilograms were functionalized with the same amine and had similar ionic conductivity. 
So it's possible to attribute such stability for the ETF uh, backbone that underwent less scission reactions and more cross-linking during irradiation when irradiating an atm um, inert atmosphere. Therefore, uh, the switch from air to N2 for inert atmosphere uh, during irradiation process can provide more reinforced membranes and stable, as well higher degree of grafting using less absorbed uh, doses or shorter grafting uh, reaction times. Um, in this last slide of ETFE membranes, I show the beginning of life uh, AMFC test for this membrane that, uh, that we got the best results. And you can see the power density obtained is very high, comparable to the pen fuel cells. And also the inoperant stability um, showed very good stability in 60 hours compared to other works. It's far away from pen fuel cells yet, but compared with uh, in AEM membranes, so it's, a, it's a good result. It's important to do this test uh, in fuel cells before starting this test with methane reactor itself. So we are able to compare our membranes with others in the literature because we don't have uh, membranes uh, for methane conversion in the literature yet, right? So uh, <clears throat> this was one of our works with ETFE membrane. It's submitted for uh, publication already. And now I'm gonna briefly show some other works we've been doing, okay? Um, so this one is uh, studies using a low density polyethylene instead of ETFE, we're using LDPE membranes. Andre, our PhD student has been checking the influence of irradiation atmosphere on this type of polymer, like we've done for the ETFE. Here in the picture, you can see the samples under the E-beam irradiator. And these are the degree of grafting and IEC results that he has obtained. Uh, something very interesting is the fact that the membrane irradiated under nitrogen for LDPE also gives the best results uh, in terms of performance. So we see here 1.2 uh, vats uh, per square centimeter. Uh, and also, and now we are investigating the effects on the stability. Uh, another work also with LDP is investigating the difference um, of membranes irradiated by EBIN uh, using the pre-irradiation the pre method for grafting and membranes irradiated by gamma ray, which uh, the grafting step occurs in situ, is the simultaneous method. So far, our results point out that uh, we have much more cross-linking being formed during EBIN irradiation uh, than during gamma irradiation. That means the membranes made using e being are more mechanically reinforced, and this affects all the physical chemical characteristics of them. So here we made like an illustration showing uh, more cross-linking in this membrane than in the other, and we got this result mainly from the mechanical tests and gel content. Um, I'm not gonna show all results here, of course, don't have time for that, but we noticed that we compare membranes, uh, if we compare these two membranes made with uh, e beam and gamma radiation, uh, we have best performance for the ones uh, irradiated under e beam. And always like this, we tested six membranes and we had this result for all of them. And here I show an example. Uh, we have like very high uh, performance, even for the, the gamma ray, it's, it's very high too. And now we are investigating the stability of these membranes to check how the cross-linking affects the durability of them. So here in the figure in the right side, uh, it's one of these durability tests. I'm actually is ongoing right now. And we can see also the carbonate uh, conductivity here around 35 millisiems which is not bad considering the size of this ion and very low mobility compared, compared to hydroxide, for example. So in this last slide, uh, I'm showing a very preliminary result from the postdoc Yasku. She is working with half technique, half raft technique. And in this case, she adds a raft agent with the monomer during the grafting step. And she is supposed to get a greater chain length control. 
so theoretically, the ion conduction will be facilitated among the side chains with the same size. In the grafting, as we do did in the previous slide, I showed in these previous slides, uh, we don't have this control. So we don't know the size of our size uh, chains. So basically, we are improving our membranes as much as we can in terms of conductivity, stability. And now we have several membranes ready to be tested for the methane conversion. And we are starting that in the upcoming weeks. And so far, we have very good results. So I would like to uh, thank you, everybody, that is watching FAPESP and Shell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana Laura. Very nice presentation. The session is open for questions. I have two questions in the chat panel. This is from Rodrigo de Souza, question one. And slide three. Slide three. Yes. You're using carbonate ion for methane activation. Yeah. And he's asking, in your reactor, is this reaction spontaneous? Uh, in my reactor, if this reaction is spontaneous. If this is a spontaneous reaction, yeah. Well, I'm going to have the carbonate, as I said, uh, the carbonate is going to donate two uh, oxygen, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> again, I'm going to have the carbonate ion in my membrane, which is going to react with the methane to, fo to form the methanol and the carbonate and the CO2, sorry. And this is a, a reaction with very high enthalpy. So that's, it's going to happen like this. Okay, so the thermodynamics of the, of yeah, the partial reaction. We have very high enthalpy in the formation of CO2. He also has a second question. There's a curiosity about the size of the channels of that membrane. So mm, he's worried yes. about the crossover. So what about the, the size of the channels of this membrane and possible crossover in your reactor? So mixing reaction. To be honest, I don't know the size of the channels. I have no idea. Uh, but I think we're not going to have this alkaline membranes. They are known to not have uh, to ha have less crossover than the pen fuel cells. But we're going to know once we do the tests. That's the reality, actually. We don't know the size. I, I just can tell you the thickness of the membranes, but I don't know the size of the channels inside. I really, because that depends also if it has uh, less cross linking, more cross linking. It depends. We're, we're studying um, these things with uh, SACS now. We're yeah. starting. And uh, maybe in the future, we're going to know. <laughs> actually, mm. actually, there is no consensus about the morphology of this kind of AEM, of these membranes. So we have a performing SACS to understand how these membranes works because you don't know exactly. So, and, the, and, and concerning crossover, I can see, I can say that it, there is no, the crossovers is lower than in comparison to Nathan, for example. So it, there is, almost no crossover by using this kind of membranes. Okay? Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, any other questions from the audience? And Laura, you, you showed some results of the conductivity changing. So if I got it right, you, you, you started your conductivity measurements with the carbonate ions. And as a function of time, you switch to hydroxide, right? Is it? Yes, yes, exactly. So, I mean, what's, what's the stability then of the carbonate membranes at this point? Um, 
I didn't perform tests on the stability in the carbonate form, but I saw, I know that our partner Israel, he performed and it's very, very good. It's better than in the hydroxide uh, form actually. Okay. But the conductivity, it's uh, significantly lower yes. when you have carbon ion, right? Yes. Interesting. Yeah, in this in this um, in this slides I showed the results at forty uh, degrees. So if we increase the temperature, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get a better conductivity. And it's not that bad. Uh, thinking that the carbonate ion is super big and uh, it has low mobility than the hydroxide, so it's not bad. The mobility of carbonate ion, it's it's one third of the hydroxyl ion. So that's the point, the, that's the reason why the carbonate and membrane is less conductive than. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? We have time for a last one before lunch break. Hi, I would like to ask. Okay, Andresa, please go ahead. Uh, Anna, how did you confirm that your synthesis worked? And how did you confirm that the functional groups were added correctly? Uh, well, I had a uh, slide and I deleted <laughs> just before presentation because it was too long, but I do that with Raman. Okay. You haven't anything else to say? Sorry, I think I could you. <laughs> um, are you uh, uh, synthesizing your membrane, uh, adding functional groups in your uh, polymer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, how, how do you know uh, um, these results uh, are you obtaining is uh, false results? Uh, are you, uh, can you sure guarantee, guarantee that there's this result is associated with your functional groups that you add in your monomer? Ah, okay, yes, yes, 100% sure because, well, first of all, we have the confirmation by Raman, but uh, for example, if I had just ETFE there, it wouldn't conduct uh, anything, right? There's no place for conduction. So I need this amine, uh, which is positive, né, uh, to conduct my onions, right? Without this amine there, it wouldn't conduct anything. If I had, for example, just BBC there, uh, there would be nothing. I need something positive to conduct the negative charges. So if they are being conducted, that means uh, my uh, amine is really working there. ETFE or LDPE would not conduct anything. You know, they're just plastic, basically. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna, Anna Laura. Very nice presentation. So um, I think there's no more questions from the audience. Ah, there's a question from YouTube. Oh, nice. Okay. What about methane results? The methane <laughs> results are coming. Uh, we were uh, waiting for the, um, uh, the spectrometer to be installed in, uh, right next to our cell, and it's happening this week. And so I think next week we're going to be ready to start. And we needed to be sure that our membranes were good, you know, like, and as we cannot compare with the literature, because there is no membranes uh, conducting carbonate, uh, we needed to do these things first. And now that we have high con conductivity and uh, stability, we can finally start our uh, methane uh, tests. We were supposed to start last year, but we had the problem of um, pandemic and, you know, so we're starting probably next week. The exp um, mass spectrometer is being installed this week. 
yeah. We finally could get a we can schedule technicians from from the supplier of our gas analysis systems to to, to commission our our reactor. So we finally gonna have everything running in the next coming days. Yeah. This is a very good question. Thank you for that. That was a question from Guy Mattioli. Thank you very much from YouTube. So I would I would like to close this session then to thank all the speakers. Let's have a round of applause for Annalara and for all the speakers Hello. of this morning. Thank you very much. Andre, do you have any? Okay. So thank you very much for, for being here with us. We, we go now for a lunch break and then we join again at 1.30 p.m. We join again in the same virtual room here for our short courses from Professor Fernando Marx and from Professor Jeff Miller in this afternoon. Please come back and join us after having some rest, lunch, stretch your legs, and uh, we're looking forward to see you again with us in this afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Again, a virtual round of applause for our speakers this morning. Thank you very much.